So, Bishop Spong, we welcome you to talk to us today, recasting the Christ story, not a rescue operation, but the birth of a new consciousness. And we thank you again for your gift that makes this possible. And we don't know how many times, we can't say it too many times, Warren, for what you've done and what you've meant to this place. And thank you once again for your support. Thank you, ma'am. Goodbye. I may not see you again. You will. Thank you very much. Joan tells me that she's going to have to walk out. I told her I'd been walked out by, by a lot of people in my life, but never one of her stature. Well, welcome back. Today I want to conclude our week together on the central symbol of the Christian story. I want to try to answer the question that was posed by Jesus, according to Mark, to the apostles at a place named Caesarea Philippi. Who do you think that I am, he said. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German Lutheran 20th century scholar, martyr, and hero, transformed that question to make it subjective, which is the only way any of us can approach it. The question is not who is Christ, he said, but who is Christ for us in our time, in our century, within the bounds of the knowledge that we have of how the world operates. How do we speak of this life in the 21st century? It is very clear to me that the traditional paradigm no longer works. The old idea of a supernatural God who lives somewhere above the sky, who invades the world with supernatural power to do miracles, who entered into the world through the person of the Virgin Mary to save the world from sin, and did so by dying on the cross, those concepts violate almost everything that we know about astrophysics, about physics, about space, about biology, about reproduction, and all the laws of cause and effect. I, thought, I find that much religious activity in our day is busily engaged in trying to resuscitate that religious corpse or to try to resuscitate it artificially. Putting a facelift on the corpse of religion is not going to create life. If there is no other way to tell the Christ story than this, then Christianity has no future and it will surely die. So let me try to put this into a familiar human context. And the day after tomorrow, Sunday, I will be speaking at a summer chapel in a place called Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. At a summer service at which I will have the privilege of baptizing one who is the infant daughter and the granddaughter of close friends of ours. I will take this precious little girl, Hedley, Hadley, into my arms. And I will say words in that liturgy that come out of a pre-modern worldview that are almost nonsensical. I will baptize that child for the forgiveness of her sins. I would be perplexed if I had to name the sins of her life. <laughs> to my knowledge, she's never robbed a bank, committed adultery, lied, cheated, or been disrespectful to her parents. Perhaps she has been inconvenient from time to time. Most babies are born with loudspeakers on one end and no sense of responsibility on the other. <laughs> In that service, I will ask her parents and her sponsors to vow in her name that she will renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil. That sounds to me like she's being programmed to be a nun. 
Now, theologians have argued through the century that these words do not refer to this child's misdeeds or even to her potential misdeeds. They argue that these words refer to a quality of human life that is present in us all. A quality of self-centeredness, a quality of selfishness. And they even have a name for this. It's called original sin. No one escapes this, they have said. It's the result, they claim, of a fall from the perfection which God intended for us all. The perfection for which human life was originally created. Now this theology, you need to understand, is not authentic to the Christian experience. It is rather a theology that was developed in the third and fourth centuries of the Christian era. It was developed in a Greek-thinking, Greek-speaking, dualistic-thinking Mediterranean world in which the Christian story was historically cast after it had left its Jewish womb and had become a Gentile church. Reading the Bible literally in that century as people like St. Augustine, the African Bishop of Hippo did, was what formed their views of reality. And on the basis of their understanding of human nature, of anthropology, if you will, they developed a theology based on the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, Augustine did not recognize what we now know about the book of Genesis. He did not know that the story of the creation in seven days, the first chapter of Genesis, was really a hymn of praise to the creator God written either while the Jews were in captivity in Babylon or shortly after their return from Babylon, which would mean it was written in the sixth century before the common era. He did not know that this first chapter was modeled after a Babylonian creation story that the Jews had encountered in their captivity. He did not know that its primary purpose was to establish the fact that the Sabbath was part of God's plan for all creation from the very beginning. And so they read it literally. And that was the way it happened, they said, because the Bible is the word of God. They also didn't know that the second chapter of Genesis and the third chapter of Genesis, which includes the familiar Adam and Eve, the serpent, and the garden story, they didn't realize it was not by the same author. They didn't realize that it was some 500 years older than the first chapter of Genesis. They thought it was just the continued story in the word of God, chapters two and three. And so they put them together. They came out with a theology and an anthropology, a view of God and a view of human life. And they used it to explain all the things about human life that they did not think they understood. If the first chapter of Genesis said that the world was created perfect and that human beings were created in the image of God, then they ask, where in the world did evil come from? And they turn to chapters 2 and 3 to explain that mystery. That ancient story, as I suggested, 500 years older than chapter 1, offered a possibility. Fourth century Christians did not see that those two were not related. So they glommed them together. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 was a continuous story. Perfect because all was the word of God. And it went like this. God created a perfect world. And human life was created in the divine image to share in God's perfection. But human life messed up God's perfection. They disobeyed God's command. 
They ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was not an apple tree. That was Jerome's addition to the tradition. It has nothing to do with an apple. And I'm really sorry about that because this little thing that jumps up and down in men's throat really can't be called Adam's apple very appropriately. A little bit of muscle. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because they ate of that tree, they corrupted themselves. And in that corruption, says this theology, they corrupted all of God's creation. It was, the fourth century believed, an act of enormous consequences for human life. It was because of this act which they call the fall that snakes today still climb on their bellies and eat the dust of the earth. It was because of the fall that women experience pain in childbirth. It was because of the fall that men have to scratch their living out of a hostile earth that often produces more briars and brambles than food. And it was because of that fall that no human life today lives in the Garden of Eden. All of us live east of Eden, to borrow John Steinbeck's phrase. And also they argued it was because of that act and its universal application that all living things will die. Death was not natural, they argued. Death was the universal punishment for the original sin of the fall. And so the escape from the fall was impossible. No one could save themselves. The only hope that people had and that was developed in this theology was that God would somehow come from outer space to their aid. And it was in terms of this analysis of the sources of evil in human life that they began to tell the Jesus story. He was God to the rescue. And this is why Christians called him names like Savior, Redeemer, Rescuer. He rescued us from the fall. He saved us from our sins. Now, how did he do this? Well, he did it by dying on the cross. That was supposed to have made perfect sense. That was their answer. When you analyze it, it's a very strange and convoluted story. But it went like this. You and I had acted in such a way as to merit divine punishment. But the punishment was far more than you and I are able to bear. And so, God punished Jesus in your place and in my place. Jesus paid the price for our sins, we said. The price that the righteousness of God required. That's when we began to baptize little infants in order to wash away from them the stain of the fall, the stain of Adam's sin. And that's why we even taught that if a baby dies before being baptized, that baby would be forever excluded from the presence of God. What a terrifying God we had created. And that's why the Jesus story was told as God coming to the rescue. The external supernatural God had to have a landing field to get into this world. And the story of the virgin birth supplied that. This God, now earthbound, had to have a launching pad to get back beyond the sky. And the story of the ascension provided that. And this seemed an appropriate way to those people to explain the Christ experience in that ancient world. And so they even developed mantras. 
statements that they repeated over and over and over again, assuming that everybody knew their meaning and no one would question them. A mantra captures an assumed truth. And one of those mantras was, Jesus died for my sins. If you haven't heard that, you haven't been inside any Christian church in your lifetime. Another mantra developed on the more liturgical side of Christianity was that in the Eucharist, what we are really doing is to reenact the moment on the cross when Jesus died to save us. And so we referred to the Eucharist in our mantra as the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, what's wrong with all of this? Everything, everything is wrong with this. But let me point out four things. Look first at what this theology does to our understanding of God. God becomes a monster. God's an ogre. God is one who does not know how to forgive. God is one who has to have a human sacrifice, a blood offering. God becomes a father whose righteousness requires that he kill the son in order to satisfy the divine need for justice. That makes God the ultimate child abuser. Who would want to worship such a God when you bring that to consciousness? Secondly, look at what it does to Jesus. It turns Jesus into a permanent and perpetual victim, perhaps even a masochist who enjoys suffering, who's eager to mount his cross and pay the price for your sins and mine. Sometimes we keep him on the cross forever so that our guilt can stay steady. Thirdly, look at what it does to you and me. It turns our religion into a religion of guilt and manipulation. You and I become guilt-filled people. The primary coin of the realm of Christianity has been guilt. Guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. You see, we are now the Christ killers. We are the ones who cause the death of Jesus. And our hymns say this over and over again. A hymn in our hymn book, the Episcopal Church, says, Ah, holy Jesus, how hast thou offended that you could come to this cross? And as the verses go on, it says, "'Twas I, Lord Jesus, I it was denied you. I crucified you. That's an incredible guilt message. And we sing it over and over again. Thank God in church, most people never pay attention to the words of the hymns. <laughs> you can put anything to a familiar tune and they'll sing it, and they don't get corrupted by the words. That's why we developed in Christianity a fetish about the blood of Jesus, attributing to it all kinds of cleansing power because we were defining human beings as pretty dirty people. If you're on the Protestant side of Christianity, you get the impression that you like to bathe in the blood of Jesus. Because that's what our hymns say. Washed in the blood, saved by the blood. There's a fountain filled with blood. Protestant hymn books are filled with bloody hymns. If you're on the Catholic side of Christianity, and I don't mean just the Roman Catholic side, the blood of Jesus is incorporated into the sacraments. So instead of bathing in it, you drink it. You get the idea that Protestants are more upset about the sins of the flesh and Catholics are more upset about the inner sins of the spirit. But the blood is cleansing in both directions because the underlying definition is that we are such sinful, evil, dirty people. And that's why when we go to church, we spend so much of our time begging for mercy. What a strange thing to say to God. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Sometimes we say it so often, we put it in Greek and say Kyrie eleison, because we're so tired of begging for mercy. Who begs for mercy? 
Seems to me that a quivering child before an abusive parent might appropriately beg for mercy. It seems to me like a convicted felon before a hanging judge might beg for mercy. But is this an appropriate way to characterize the relationship between the human and the divine? The message of the Christian church cannot be just guilt. Guilt doesn't produce life. I've never known a baby to have his or her being affirmed by having a parent sit the child on their knee and say, I want to tell you something, kid. You were born in sin. You ain't worth nothing. You can't do anything without God. Do you think that would raise a healthy adult? Sometimes you look at the adult Christians and you see the results. The fourth thing is that's wrong with this is that it is simply not so. We no longer think of the origins of the world or the origins of human life in this ancient pattern. And everywhere in the world, we've caught up with that except in our religious formulations. In 1859 in England, a man who at one point had wanted to be an Anglican priest, whose name was Charles Robert Darwin, published a book called The Origin of Species. And many parts of the Christian church have been fighting Darwin from that day to this in the name of their prehistoric and pre-modern understanding of human origins. Darwin in that book offered a very different view of our humanity and also a different view of the source of human evil. There was no perfect creation, said Darwin. There was no finished creation. Creation is an ongoing process. It's ever-changing and ever-evolving. Life is not static. Life has developed over the last 3.8 billion years from single cells into self-conscious complexity, like you and me. Now think about what that means. If there was no perfect creation, there could never have been a fall from perfection, not even metaphorically. And if there was not a fall, there's no need to be rescued or saved. If the fall never happened, then you can't be rescued from a fall that never happened, and you cannot be restored to a status you've never possessed. So the whole system falls apart. Our understanding of human life, our understanding of God, our understanding of Jesus. The whole religious definition of what it meant to be human is simply wrong. I am not looking out today on an audience of fallen sinners. I'm looking out today on an audience of human beings who have not yet achieved the fullness of their humanity. We don't need a savior. We need a power and a presence that will take us from where we are into becoming all that we are capable of being. That's a very different way to approach human life. So let me peel back the explanations of our religious past without destroying the experience that they were trying to explain and ask what it was that that primary experience consisted of. Why did people see in Jesus someone about, around whom they could build this incredible theological system? To see him as the savior sent from God to rescue the fallen creation. There had to be something about his life. 
that caused them to think it was an appropriate way to explain his power. So what was it? Was it the fact that he was thought to be the worker of miracles? Well, that can hardly be the case. But we can find absolutely no evidence in any Christian source that miracles were ever associated with the memory of Jesus until the eighth decade of the first century. Did they build this kind of mythology around Jesus because he was said to have had a miraculous birth? Well, that could hardly be the answer. Because once again, stories of his supernatural birth did not arrive in the Christian tradition until the ninth decade of the first century. That's 60 or so years after the life of Jesus had come to an end. Was it that somehow they believed that Jesus had risen physically from the dead? That he had walked out of his tomb alive? Well, that could hardly be the reason either. Because if you know anything about the origins of the Gospels and the biblical tradition, you know that interpreting the resurrection as bodily resuscitation back into the physical life of this world is not present in Paul, it's not present in Mark, it might be hinted at in Matthew, but it only becomes virulent in Luke and in John. Ninth and tenth decade pieces finally transform whatever Easter was into physical resuscitation of a deceased body on the third day. So what was the original power? What was the experience that demanded that it be interpreted? Well, let me offer a possibility. When I look at the portrait of Jesus as it is refracted to me through the Gospels and through the Christian tradition, I see Jesus primarily as a boundary breaker. I see Jesus as a life that is able somehow to affirm his and our humanity so deeply that you and I begin to be free to lay down the security barriers that each of us builds around ourselves to enhance our survival. I see Jesus as a life and a power that calls us to be willing to step beyond what is a biological drive to survival that's present in every living thing. It's written deep into our DNA, and that is what binds us into self-centered human beings. It's our biology, it's not our sinfulness. I see Jesus as one who enables us to lay down our fears, our struggle to become because somehow in what he represented, we discovered the courage to be that which each of us really is. I see him as one who encourages us to enter a new consciousness, to walk into new dimensions of what it means to be human. I don't see him as the subject of the creeds, but as an experience of life. Let me take you quickly through the New Testament and watch it enfold in the service of this kind of understanding of Jesus. Let me take you first to Paul's second epistle, written to the Galatians about the year 52. And what Paul says is that if you are inside whatever the Christ experience is, you discover that barriers fall away. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Jew nor Greek. In Christ there's neither male nor female. In Christ there's neither bond nor free. I'm sure the principle goes on. In Christ there's neither gay nor straight. There's neither Jew nor Muslim. There's neither Catholic nor Protestant. There's neither Orthodox or Reform. There's neither Sunni nor Shia. 
but what there is is a new creation. That is, in Christ we are called to be so deeply and fully human that we no longer have to spend our energy building ourselves up by tearing someone else down, proving our superiority in all kinds of ways, religious, religiously being one of them. So Paul understood that. Now let me take you to Mark, the first gospel, to the last story before the Easter story. Mark chapter 15. Jesus is limp and dead on the cross. And what does Mark do? He puts an unclean Gentile at the foot of the cross and has him interpret Jesus. A Roman soldier, unwashed, uncircumcised, non-kosher. He stands underneath the cross and he looks at this life who was free to give himself away completely. Never to strike back at those who were taking his life from him. And it's this Roman soldier that says, that's what God is like. The freedom to love beyond boundaries, the freedom to give your life away. Now that's not the way we translated it in the New Testament. We translated it with that soldier saying, Truly this man was the son of God, as if he just passed a course in Nicene Theology 101. That's 300 years later. He's saying, I see in the human ability to escape its boundaries and to give its life away, that's where I see the presence of God. However you define God. Next go to Matthew, the second gospel. Matthew tells his story of Jesus inside an interpretive envelope. The first part of that envelope is the birth narrative. Matthew says that when Jesus was born, a star appeared in the sky to announce the birth. What's so unusual about a star? It doesn't just shine on the land of the Jews. It shines over the whole world. And that star, says Matthew, brings people beyond their tribal boundaries into a new experience of what it means to be human. That's what the wise men were about. They were Gentiles, drawn by the power of this life, drawn beyond their boundaries and their fears. They weren't people who had just escaped a recent costume party. It's a great story when you understand it. And I might add parenthetically, it's a biblical story. It's based on Isaiah 60, but most people don't know that. If you go back to Isaiah 60, you'll find that kings will come to the brightness of God's rising. They'll come on camels, and they'll bring gold and frankincense. Doesn't that sound a little bit familiar? Somebody's always going to say, where's the myrrh? Well, the myrrh is there because Isaiah 60 says they come from Sheba. And the Jewish mind said, Sheba. Wasn't there another story in our tradition about another royal visitor who went to visit another king of the Jews? So they go back to the story of the queen of Sheba. And guess what she brought? Truckloads of spices. And the primary spice that they knew at that time in the Middle East was myrrh, a sweet-smelling rosin from a gum tree. Matthew is not talking about history. Matthew is interpreting the power of the Christ experience. The whole world is drawn into a new humanity by whatever this Jesus represented. So then go to Luke. Luke is the only story, only gospel writer that gives us a story of the Pentecost experience, what Christians call Whitsunday. It's in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. It's a fascinating story because the story says that when the Spirit of God fell on the gathered Christian community, they became spirit-filled. They didn't become religious. God knows we've got enough religion in this world. We don't need any more. They didn't become religious. They were lifted beyond their tribal boundaries. They laid down their security system. And when they did, they found they could communicate with anyone in whatever language they spoke. Because the language of human love is universal. 
This is not a miracle story. Peter didn't suddenly begin to speak Chinese or German. Don't be so literal and so dumb about the Bible. And then you go to John. John argues in something that most people are not aware. That the moment in which Jesus is glorified is not the resurrection. It is not the ascension. The moment in which he is glorified is the crucifixion. It is only when he is lifted up on the cross, says John, that he will draw all people to himself. Because John saw the crucifixion as the moment when Jesus acted out his human freedom to give himself away in love, even to those who were killing him. That's a new vision of what it means to be human. You see, what we need to understand is that divinity is not the opposite of humanity. Divinity is the depth of humanity. The only way any of us can ever be divine is to become so deeply and fully human that we're open to whatever the spirit of divinity is to live in us and through us. The claim we Christians make for the divinity of Jesus is really a claim that his humanity was whole and free and that he became a vessel through which whatever we think God is, God could be experienced as present. You see, in the Gospels, if you scratch away the explanations of the first century, you discover that to be fully human is to be perceived as divine, and that it was in Jesus' full humanity that people saw a God presence in him. And that drives me to my conclusion. If I had to pick my favorite verse in all of the New Testament, it would be from the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. And the words that are in that chapter by themselves don't quite communicate their own power. So you almost have to play with the text a little. So I see Jesus and his disciples in some kind of dialogue. Remember, this is some 70 years after the death of Jesus that it's written. The disciples are perceived as saying to Jesus, Jesus, tell us why you came. What was your purpose? And then they offered a possibility. Was it to make us religious? Jesus said, no. No, we've got a lot of religion in the world already, and most of it's pretty evil. No, I didn't come to make you religious. Well, Jesus, did you come to make us moral and righteous? And Jesus says, no, no, I didn't do that either. My experience with people who are very, very moral and very, very righteous is that they know a great deal about judgment, but almost nothing about loving. No, I didn't come to create morality and righteousness. Well, Jesus, did you come so that we would have the true faith? We would be the orthodox believers. Jesus shakes his head and says, no, I didn't come for that purpose either. He said, my experience with people who think they have the true faith is that they always put their wagons in a circle and start shooting at other people. No, we don't need more of that. And then there's a sort of exasperation. Well, why in the world did you come? And he responds with words that I think ought to ring out of every pulpit of the Christian world on every occasion of worship. I have come, he said, that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. That's what our faith is about. It's not about making you religious or moral or right. Our faith is about calling you to live, calling you into the fullness of humanity. We do not need to be saved. We need to become deeply and fully human. We don't need to be born again. We need to grow up. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, to 
be a Christian is not to be a religious man or woman. To be a Christian is simply to be a whole man or a whole woman. The fullness of our humanity is that which can enter into the sense of the holy. So we go from being conscious creatures to being self-conscious creatures to stepping in what we might call the universal consciousness of God. To live in my religious tradition is to be challenged to live fully and to love wastefully and to be all that each of us is capable of being. And then to become an agent of giving that life and that love and that freedom to be to every other child of God. There is no room in my religious tradition for those who have to build themselves up by tearing someone else down. For those who have to build up their religion by tearing down somebody else's religion. For those who have to prove that they are normal by proving that everybody not like them must be abnormal. The call of the Christ, as I understand it, is the call to life and to love and to being. And that is why I walk the Christ path. But the Christ path leads me into the fullness of my own humanity, where oneness with the holy and oneness with all other parts of the human family can be celebrated and all boundaries transcended, and our life together treasured. So, my brothers and sisters, I bid you to start your pilgrimage from where you are. That's the only place from which you can start. Start from where you are, and commit yourself to living fully, to loving wastefully beyond all boundaries, and to having the courage to be all that you can be so that you can help others become all that they can be. For this is the doorway, I believe, into the meaning of God. Thank you very much for this week.